Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. On behalf of the staff and the Board of Trustees of the Institute, I would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a very good New Year. On behalf of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO and Working Rhode Island, we would like to uh, wish everybody a very healthy and happy holiday season and a Merry Christmas. This is a great time of the year to uh, spend some time with your family, appreciate your family, uh, say thanks for all of the, the wonderful things that have happened in your life. And uh, on behalf of the labor movement, we are committed to making sure that we continue to make progress to improve the wages, benefits, working conditions, and make sure people have a say in their life. Once again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, have a healthy and safe season. Hi, I'm Ron Coya. I'm business manager of Labor's Local Union 1033, and it's my pleasure to wish everybody a very happy holiday season on behalf of the members, officers, and staff of Local Union 1033. Happy holidays. Hi, my name is Jim Riley, Secretary Treasury of United Food and Commercial Workers Local 328, and I want to take this opportunity to wish a Merry, Merry Christmas to all my friends, all my friends in the labor movement, and especially all the 12,000 members of Local 328 in Rhode Island and Southeastern Massachusetts. We are here with you today to support this new struggle that just started with the boycott of this hotel. At our most recent convention, your union brought this issue up to the whole labor movement and asked for the support of the whole labor movement if the workers here declared a boycott. We are here today to say, you did that, we're with you. This is a very simple message. It's about economic justice and economic power. They think they have economic power right now. We are going to show them in this community that this, the activities here will not be tolerated until there is a good union contract. We'll start the fight today and we'll win tomorrow. Yeah! And the president of George Nee dice que okay. Del AFL-CIO, la Federación de los Sindicatos en ese estado. Estoy aquí para representarlo, para decir, para decir que estamos contigo. Todos los sindicatos. Y en la última convención del AFL-CIO, de la Federación, representantes de su unión vinieron. Papizón vino, Carmen vino, para preguntarnos que si ustedes... Llamen un boycott si ustedes te apoyarían. Y estoy aquí para decir que sí, te apoyamos. Todos los sindicatos, la federación, te apoyamos. Y vamos a estar contigo hasta que ustedes ganen un contrato bueno y una unión dentro de ese hotel. Gracias, Adjourney. So right now we have a major announcement to show the hotel and to show the public that this is not just a fight of words, but this is a fight of action. A representative from the Universalist Unitarian Church that had many reservations at this hotel for the upcoming year. Reverend. I'm James Ford. I'm the senior minister of the First Unitarian Church of Providence. If we lose a few more leaves, you can see it across these trees. I represent uh, today the Unitarian Universalist Association. Our president, uh, the Reverend uh, 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 Peter Morales, and and our 1,000 congregations. We will be gathering here for our annual convention, the General Assembly, in in May. When we uh, first started organizing this convention, we booked a large block of rooms here at the Renaissance, and we uh, do due diligence. 
we are informed by uh, our spiritual principles, the first of which is the uh, inherent dignity and worth of every human being. And we saw, sadly, that these otherwise good people have fallen short on that promise of, of human possibility by refusing to engage in a dialogue with, with the union, by refusing to address the questions of health and safety, and most of all, by refusing to talk about a living wage. Because of this, the Unitarian Universalist Association has withdrawn its block of room. <laughs> Enjoy with this boycott, and we will stand with you until justice is achieved. Thank you. Wow. Él dijo que él es de la iglesia de los Unitarian Universalists y cada año ellos tienen una conferencia y ese en el año que viene en 2014 ellos van a tener una conferencia en mayo. Y ellos hicieron un, una reservación de muchos cuartos aquí en el Renaissance. Pero cuando ellos um, supieron que hay muchas uh, cosas injustas aquí, que ellos no están tratando a sus empleados con respeto, que hay cosas de, que uh, hay condiciones que no son seguras aquí, ellos decidieron que ellos van a sacar, terminar su contrato con el hotel, hotel y ellos no tienen reservaciones aquí, no más. Um, I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank all the partners and funders. If you flip your program over, you'll see a very long list of names and organizations right here. When we started six years ago, we had four partners. We had two hospitals, we had two community-based organizations, and you can add up over 50 partners on this list today, so that's something we're very proud of. I'm also happy to walk, I saw some familiar faces in the audience from Dorcas International Institute, from the United Way, we have folks from the mayor, the mayors here, and from the representatives from the mayor's office, I see Toby back there, <laughs> our friends from the Living Right Project, I see Ken, Jenny from the the Miriam, and we have managers, and everybody who's here supporting you today. So I just wanted to take a moment to recognize them and members of our board of trustees. We have Brandon Melton, who came back to visit, Lou Sperling, Doug McNeil is a new member. Any other board of trustees here? Trustee members? Who's over there? Betty, Betty, manager and board of trustee member. <laughs> Um, so a special thank you to all of you and to the managers and supervisors who host internships from this graduating class. Many thanks as well to Rhode Island Hospital today for hosting the event and to our UNAP Rhode Island Hospital Education Fund Board of Trustees for your leadership. If you don't know, Stepping Up is a project of the UNAP Rhode Island Hospital Education Fund, um, which is uh, partnered with Women and Infants Hospital to actually operate the Stepping Up program. Um, thank you also to Sandra, to Aaron, and Barry. If you could just wave your hand. Where's Barry? Over here. <laughs> thank you for all the massive planning that went to, into today's event over the last few weeks. Um, and to everybody who came to help celebrate today. I always like the December graduation best. We do these once in the summer, once around this time of year, because it falls during that special time of year when we reflect on all the good things in life all the blessings we've had throughout the year, and all the even better things in the years to come. And that's really what a graduation should be about. I'm very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Mr. Kyle Bennett. Kyle has been with the United Way of Rhode Island for over five years and is now the director of the annual campaign, working with 450 companies to secure, are you ready for this? Over $9 million in annual contributions. Nice job, Kyle. <laughs> These contributions have benefited stepping up in today's graduates in significant ways, as you will hear later during the graduate speeches. At last count, stepping up had offered 380 internships that have led individuals to jobs, continued education, and on a healthcare career pathway. 
Some of Kyle Bennett's past jobs include Director of Black Affairs for the City of Providence and Communication Specialist for the Rhode Island Air National Guard, and in addition to a long list of volunteer jobs and board memberships listed on his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, and I also hear that Kyle's an active friend of, of Stepping Up's Facebook page, frequently liking and commenting on our posts. Um, so <laughs> After attending many graduations, it is our pleasure to invite Kyle Bennett to speak today. Kyle. Good morning, everyone. So, as you heard, my name is Kyle Bennett. I'd like to say thank you to Amy, um, as well as Sandra, for the invitation to speak to you all today. I'd like to recognize the mayor, good morning, mayor. I see, as you mentioned, Amy in the back, and my colleague in the Workforce Development Program here, our manager at United Way, Jennifer Rossi, um, also from United Way. Please give her a round of applause for all of her work. Please. So I have to say, you don't know how excited I am to be here today. When I joined United Way, it was just about the time that this program was the inception of the program. And I remember sitting in the conference center with Amy, uh, Mike Peruta, who I don't see yet, Brandon Melton was there and several other folks, and they were talking about this new program that would merge labor, management, and most importantly, our community. People who live right in the vicinity of this hospital and other places who traditionally didn't have access to the hospital system, and they were gonna move into entry-level positions where they had the opportunity to take additional classes, where they could do that right on this campus and move up into a career path. That was brand new. I'd never heard anything like that. I didn't know if it would work. I thought it was kind of crazy at the time, but I loved it. I was so excited, and every year when I get the opportunity, I come back to this graduation because I see the faces who are sitting here, and it's always the same. A face that has hope, a face that has promise of future, and a face that is ready to do the hard work that it's gonna take to move our community forward. I wanted to uh, now uh, ask Mr. Taveras to come and uh, speak to our graduates and to share some inspiring words. And we really do appreciate you coming uh, out of your busy schedule. Thank you, Sandra. And it's great to be here with you, with Elena, uh, with Kyle, uh, with everyone here. I want to recognize all the key funders, Rhode Island Foundation, UNAP, Rhode Island Hospital, United Way of Rhode Island, Governor's Workforce Board of Rhode Island, CCRI uh, Pace, uh, Living Right, and Brown University. First and foremost, seriously say congratulations to all of you. Uh, this is a very, very special day, and, and it's great to see so many family members here, and particularly the young children as well. Um, so I want to congratulate all of the graduates today on this very, very special day. Um, this is a, uh, for me, it's a thrill to see uh, because it's really about um, people helping people. And um, that's what stepping up is all about. It's about creating an opportunity for others. And the opportunity that's created is really you're going to be involved in something that is so critical for us in our healthcare industry. And we know that healthcare is growing quickly. Um, and that really means about helping other people, people who are in need. And so uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, with you. I want to recognize uh, as well the sacrifices you've made. I know many of you have families, some have other jobs, and you've been doing this uh, with those uh, challenges. And um, I say to you, I am extremely, extremely proud of you and what you've done. And I hope you'll ex uh, allow me uh, the, uh, the privilege of uh, speaking a little Spanish and dejándoles saber a todos que están aquí, especialmente eso que tienen familia, que han sacrificado tanto con diferente trabajo también y su familia para llegar a este día. Eh, lo felicito de todo el corazón. Es eh, para mí un orgullo poder participar con ustedes hoy en este día. Y me siento bien de ver a los niños aquí eh, disfrutando también con todos ustedes. And let me just say that uh, what, I wanna, uh, what I really want to encourage you is a couple of things. One is to keep going, um, that this is a beginning. Um, that what you have done is really better yourself and better your family, and that we need you to keep going uh, and to keep stepping up. There are still more, uh, more stairs that you can climb. You can go a lot higher as well. So <clears throat> always set your own goals and keep going. 
Um, two, I want to encourage you to um, never forget. See, he's with me. So, uh, I want to encourage you to, as you step up, never forget to help others come up. Never forget. He agrees. He, he agrees. So never forget to help others come up and be that example um, and help others. As you have had someone, I'm sure, that's made a difference in your life, uh, be that difference in someone else's life. Be that example and let them know, if I did it, you can do it, and I'll help you get there. Never forget where we come from. Never forget those um, that still struggle and have challenges and help them up that ladder as well. So I want to encourage you to do that. The third thing I want to do is I want to say, uh, and this is not because he's here, but it is uh, to a degree because of him, the young kids in the back as well. You are an example for all of them. Keep being a positive example for your families, for your loved ones, and letting them know um, that the sky is the limit, that you can achieve, um, that it is not easy, the road is not easy, that there are obstacles along the way, but you can overcome those obstacles. And I say that personally, standing here, um, from a mother who worked in factories, second and third shift, uh, second and first shift to raise us, uh, and yet her son can stand before you today as the mayor of Providence. And you, you, you never know the example that you make as parents, uh, as your children look at you to see uh, what you do and to see that their parents are doing better and the sacrifices that you're making, it has an impact on your children. Believe me, I know because it had an impact on my life. So I want to encourage you uh, to continue to be that positive example uh, throughout our community. We need you now more than ever uh, throughout the state of Rhode Island. So today, uh, I am happy to be here celebrating with you. I have brought citations for everyone. And I'm not going to read all the citations because they're similar. Uh, I am going to read one, though, that will be presented out um, to you. And it's a citizen citation presented to the graduate. Uh, and it has your individual name. I, Angel Tavares, Mayor of the City of Providence, do hereby confer upon you this citation in recognition of your completion of the course of study and training for the Stepping Up Program, a collaborative job training initiative that prepares students for careers in the healthcare field. The residents of Providence join me in stepping up partners at hospitals, labor organizations, colleges, social service organizations, and education and training agencies in congratulating you and your fellow graduates on your achievement, wishing you much success and growth in the future. Given under the seal of the, city, uh, given under the, seal of the mayor of the city of Providence this 10th day of December 2013. Congratulations to all of you. Wish you nothing but success. Keep up the great work. Felicidades a todos. Le deseo nada más que éxito y sigan adelante. Gracias. I apologize. I have to go. Uh, lo siento, tengo que eh, irme, pero quería estar aquí para celebrar este momento con ustedes. But I wanted to be here to celebrate this special moment with you. Congratulations, keep up the great work, and happy holidays. Outgoing, personable, driven, and intelligent, Opal Bryce is a leader and a true example of the professionalism that Stepping Up teaches. She supported her classmates continually, excelled, and was a leader in the class. She was an asset to, at labor and delivery at Women and Infants Hospital, where she did her internship. Her manager raved about how well she did and how she went above and beyond of what was expected of her. The unit was very impressed by her and pleased with all that she did and didn't want her to leave. Please welcome Ms. Opal Bryce from the Genesis Center. Good morning. Getting it together. Okay, so first I would like to say thank you to Erin. Thank you to Sandra as well. Thank you to the entire Stepping Up organization. On the behalf of myself and my classmates for believing in us all. 
Thank you to my classmates for trusting me enough to speak on their behalf. I hope that with this speech, I can speak for each and every one of us who are graduating today. When I heard about the Stepping Up program, it immediately caught my attention. It was just a name in itself, the Stepping Up program. It almost seemed like it was too good to be true. After doing some research and even traveling to the Woonsocket location to learn more, I decided that there was no better time. I decided that there was no better time to start reaching my goals that I have set out for myself and that there was no other place to start than the Stepping Up program. My motivation and my drive to reach my goals stem from knowing that my daughters see me as a positive role model and I want them to know that hard work and dedication will help them to succeed in life. I am confident that by setting this example, my daughters will reach their goals with confidence. When I became a certified nursing assistant, I started on the path towards <clears throat> reaching my goals on the healthcare ladder. However, as a CNA, I became a, one of many on the, who wanted to work in a stable healthcare environment. And as I applied for positions in healthcare facilities, to no availability, I began to lose hope and confidence. Through the Stepping Up program, I now own confidence that I will achieve my goals to become employed in a grounded position with an opportunity to advance in my career path. Through the Stepping Up, I have gained a greater strength in my motivation and my determination to further my education. Over the course of 13 weeks, in which my classmates and I experienced intense training and preparations to enter the healthcare workforce, I have become more driven. My classmates and I will continue to develop and grow through continuing our education and our professionalism. To my classmates, thank you all for your effort and continued energy that you have put into the class and all of the activities which afforded us an opportunity to grow further and to develop. Each and every one of us supported one another day in and day out through this entire learning experience. And I know that we succeeded because of that support. We were all so motivated by each other. We held each other to high standards and we lifted one another up as we all were so eager to succeed. To all graduates, we have now stepped on the healthcare ladder. Together we are stepping up. Thank you. Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? In the lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight, we're happy tonight. Walking in a winter wonderland. Gone away is the bluebird. Here to stay is the new bird. He sings a love song as we go along. Walking in a winter wonderland. Hello, my name is Michael Sabatoni. I'm president of the Rhode Island Building and Construction Trades Council and business manager of the Rhode Island Laborers District Council. We're down here at the Rhode Island Convention Center today participating for our third year in a row at the Feed 1000 event. This is truly a special occasion where you have members of the labor community, the business community, uh, politicians, uh, universities, volunteers all come together for a worthy cause and an unfortunate cause which is to help uh, create some holiday cheer and some Christmas cheer uh, for individuals during the holidays that are a little less fortunate. So I couldn't be more proud of the cast of the volunteers that we have here today of Organized Labor, of SMG for hosting this event, PMG Charities and uh, Rich Santilli for all the fine work that he does in putting this event together for the third year. So on behalf of all the members of the Building Trades and the Laborers International Union, we wish you all a very safe and happy holiday season. Thank you. I'm Rich Santilli. I'm the president of PMG Charities, and we're uh, the ones that are floating on the Feed 1000 event. Uh, lots of meetings, 
with lots of folks that help volunteer here, um, culminating with today. We started setting up the room three days ago, and uh, we finished about 4 o'clock last night, and it was just the way we wanted it, and folks started coming in at 11 o'clock today. How many do you think we're going to feed? Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm a little nervous about how many we're going to feed today. Probably well in excess of 2,000 people. I just actually, we had about 400 toys that we had purchased for the children. And I just sent my business partner out to get another 150 because I don't think we have enough. And one thing we don't want to do with this event is send somebody home without something. So we're going to do the best we can to get everybody a present at least. A lot of kids though. It's a lot of people putting a lot of time in and effort to pull it off. But it's a great event and uh, people enjoy coming to it. So we'll do it as long as they need. Feed 1,000. Um a lot of community volunteers and a lot, large portion of union volunteers from unions across Rhode Island. Someone said to me early, this is a good day. It is a good day, a good day for charitable endeavor, but it's a sad day because of the volume of people who are here, Rhode Islanders, who need a coat, a hat, and a meal is overwhelming. So as good as it is, I find this kind of sad. I'm glad we're doing this kind of work, but I wish all of Rhode Island was aware of what's really going on today. I wish Rhode Islanders could see the line downstairs that goes out the block. Hi, my name is Shelly Souza Sloan and I am here with the Rhode Island Parent Information Network. We are located in Cranston, Rhode Island and I am here promoting um, our newest program, Rye Reach, which is basically um, we are here to let everybody know about Obamacare and the new health insurance for Rhode Island. So many people that we are seeing today do not have health insurance um, or they're not um, sure how to afford it or where to get it. So today for the Feed 1000 event, um, I'm here promoting um, health insurance and trying to help the people of Rhode Island um, access um, affordable health insurance. So uh, Rhode Island Parent Information Network has been involved with um, many nonprofit and um, organizations such as Feed 1000 and we are here to um, make sure everybody has a happy holiday and I think it's a wonderful event. Season's greetings. Hi, my name is uh, Dave Watson, and this is my son Dane. And uh, we're members. Of, I am a member of the uh, IBW Local 99, and we're here uh, giving back to our community and helping out those people in need. And my son loves participating in this, and he's missing a children's Christmas party to be here for this. So, hi, I'm Jimmy Riley, Secretary Treasurer of United Food and Commercial Workers Local 328. And I'm here at one of my favorite events of the year with Mike Sabatoni and laborers in the building trades coming out here and feeding a thousand time, a thousand people. Christmas time is near and I'm at the happiest place that I want to be. It's so wonderful in here to be helping these people with the coats and with the hats and the food and everything. I really believe that even John DiPietro's heart might warm. Larry Lepore, I'm the general manager here at the Rhode Island Convention Center. It's been an interesting day here feeding um, two o'clock Feeding 1,000, which is actually probably about 2,000 people, have been through the door already. And a, great, a lot of great support, a lot of great help from the laborers, uh, the setup, the tear down. Uh, certainly without their support, we would never be able to do this event. All the trades though, have always stepped up, and it's been one uh, event that it seems like everybody seems to get behind. Uh, just, uh, it's unfortunate that other Rhode Islanders can't come in and see what takes place today. This is a very special day for all Rhode Islanders, something that Rhode Islanders could be proud of. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.
Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm joined today by Dr. Colleen Callahan, the Director of Professional Issues at the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers. Hi, Colleen, and welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. Um, we've had a number of shows to this point on teacher evaluation, and you've given us a fair history of where we are in the state. Um, what have we learned so far? You've been involved in this for almost two years now? Even a little bit longer than that. Um, I'd say over the last couple of years, school districts across Rhode Island have been working very, very hard to implement new teacher evaluation systems. And um, they've been focusing a lot on the implementation of the new requirements, working together to make sure that things are implemented uh, the way in which uh, they were intended. Um, what we've learned has not really been that surprising. Teachers and principals want to be evaluated. They want good feedback on their practice. They just want to make sure that the system is fair and reliable. Union leaders agree, and many of them, including those union leaders that represent the Rhode Island Innovation Districts, are working very closely with their administrative partners to make sure that evaluators and teachers get the information they need, that they address the problems that they are learning about through the early years of implementation, and that the implementation of the program is focused on what it should be focused on, which is supporting teachers and principals in their professional growth. In your model, you have superintendents, principals, union leaders, teachers in a collaborative approach to addressing the issue of teacher evaluation. And you've said that teachers want to be evaluated, administrators want to do their job of evaluating them. What are the challenges that districts are finding in this collaborative model? Because they are able to talk back and forth and work out solutions to issues that may arise in this collaborative format. But what are the challenges that you're finding? Well, I think the challenges exist across all the formats. And, and I do think that in terms of the innovation districts, we're learning something from the work that's going on in Central Falls and Cranston, in Pawtucket, Providence, West Warwick, and Woonsocket that I think affirms the fact that if, in fact, you're going to do this kind of work and do it well, you need to do it collaboratively. So while there are challenges in those districts, I think that those challenges are being met. And I'm not just saying they're only being met in those districts, but they're clearly being met more successfully in places where there's good collaboration. In terms of what real challenges principals, teachers, evaluators face regarding the implementation of the new evaluation system, I think you'll find that those challenges exist across all of the districts. And that's what we're hearing statewide from our innovation partners and from the other folks that are working on um, this new set of requirements. Um, one of the biggest ones is time, and that no matter what part of the evaluation system you're looking at, time is a major factor. Um, this is not your grandfather's Oldsmobile. I think I've said that before. And it is similar but vastly different from the way in which we've evaluated people in the past, and it's taking a lot more time. But I think particularly over the last year, as we're getting used to some of the mechanics of the new system, what the biggest problem is is this requirement to utilize evidence of student learning as a way to measure teacher and principal effectiveness. That is required. We have two big components of the teacher evaluation system. One is something that we're all pretty familiar with, and that's the idea of gathering evidence on teacher and principal practice by observing it, by going in and looking and seeing what people are doing. The other is this uh, requirement that teacher evaluation is based primarily on student growth and achievement. And so there's a big question about how do we do that. Teachers and principals will tell you that they take their responsibility to ensuring student growth and achievement very seriously. I was a teacher for a long time. My colleagues in the teaching profession will tell you that we set goals for our students. We carefully monitor their progress um, over the course of the year, over the course of a unit. Um, we adjust our practice as necessary. And what we look for at the end of the year is to make sure that students have met the goals and exceeded the goals that we've set for them. We want to make sure that each and every student achieves. It's a little more difficult than it sounds to tie that to determining how effective a teacher or principal is. Lots of questions exist around um, whether or not you can accurately and fairly attach a measure of student learning to a particular teacher, to a group of teachers, or whether or not there are other factors involved. So while intrinsically educators are saying, that's my greatest responsibility, 
they're very concerned about the process that's being followed right now in determining how much impact the teacher, the principal has on that student and whether or not the methods for making that determination are the appropriate ones. Let me, let me ask you a question. I spent 20 years in a classroom as a teacher and, and I understand clearly that there are a lot of factors in a classroom of 35 students ranging from parent involvement to whether or not the child, a student, came to school having breakfast that morning. Mm -hmm. a, lot of con a lot of factors that teachers may not have control over. But then we come to the issue of assessments, the assessment that's being used as a part of the teacher evaluation system. What assessment is being used and what are the other options? Okay, good question. On the first issue, we do recognize there are many, many, many factors um, that go into um, teacher and student success. And while we have to recognize those, a teacher's job, of course, is to try his or her best to um, address each and every child's needs. That's the work of a teacher. Um, by the same token, um, there are some things that are outside of our control, and that's part of what's playing into the concerns about making sure that we get the assessment piece right. So right now, it's, um, I don't think anybody can miss the controversy around using statewide assessment. When the Department of Education uh, decided and when the Board of Regents determined that teacher evaluation would be based primarily on student growth and achievement, um, one of the original ideas was to determine that based on the statewide assessment. And there are lots of questions about the use of statewide assessment for either uh, the evaluation of teachers and administrators or for things like um, determining high school graduation, as we've seen in the news and lots of things being talked about today around that issue. Luckily, the idea of the growth factor or determining effectiveness based on statewide assessment is something that's still in discussion and we have at least another year um, to continue talking about that and, and figuring out whether and how that will be used in teacher evaluation. That was a good thing to get off the plate this year, good, good determination by the Department of Education and the Commissioner. There is another way um, that is being required by the Department of Education to measure student progress and it's something called student learning objectives. We usually say SLOs. And they're really, in concept, a good idea. They're something, it's something that the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and the American Federation of Teachers fought hard for, something that our colleagues at the NEA also support. And they do so because it's a measure of student learning and student progress that is closer to the classroom. So as I said before, when I was a teacher, uh, at the beginning of the year, I looked at what I knew about my students, where they were, where they are. And I looked at those important learnings. What did I have to get through in terms of curriculum? What were the benchmarks for success? What were the standards that I had to meet or that my students had to meet? And set goals appropriately. You use those goals to check in on student progress through the year, to monitor your own teaching, to monitor student progress, and change things as ne necessary, provide supports as necessary, and then um, as we move toward the end of the year to determine how far your students have progressed. And so that seems on its face to be the right way, or at least a better way, to be able to determine how much progress students have made during the year. The problem with using it right now um, as a factor in determining teacher effectiveness, principal effectiveness, is that we're just learning about how to do this right. And so while it sounds like something that we can all nod our head about because it's pretty familiar, the process that has been laid out has, is proving to be um, very cumbersome, somewhat time consuming, and until there's the right amount of training and practice given, there's not the kind of consistency we need to make sure that we can use that measure in a high stakes environment. To make sure that if in fact we're going to factor that in to a teacher or a principal's final effectiveness rating, that we are very, very sure that it's an appropriate measure, that whether or not the measure, the objectives have been met are fairly determined, and then, quite frankly, the big mystery of all of it is how that number is put together with the other evidence of teacher practice to come up with a final effectiveness rating. It's often been said that 
you know, the teachers union is going to come up with their own slant on the issue of student learning outcomes. And, you know, I hate using SLOs and acronyms, and education is full of them. But there has been a lot of discussion around SLOs lately and around these student outcomes and or student learning outcomes. Um, recently, the Federation of Teachers, the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers, and the Innovation Districts commissioned a report from a third party. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm assuming that was done specifically so that you could cite a non-biased opinion around SLOs, their values, and, and, and how they fit within the system. What did the report say? This is the report. It's called Focus on Rhode Island, and you're absolutely correct. The Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and the Innovation Districts um, wanted to make sure that we dug a little bit more deeply into the questions and the concerns that we were hearing from principals, from teachers in our districts, and quite frankly, um, at the Federation of Teachers, um, that we were hearing from teachers and principals across the state. Um, the NEA was hearing very similar things, and in fact, last year we did a poll um, and had a resolution adopted that expressed our concern and the concern of our members about the way in which student learning objectives were being rolled out. Um, but we did think it was important to find out what the experts thought of this, and so we um, commissioned a study, an analysis of the student learning objective design and process by a group called the um, Community Training and Assistance Center. We use another acronym for them, we call them CTAC. But they are essentially the um, one of the premier research organizations in the country with experience on student learning objectives. And so we uh, contracted with them to conduct an analysis, as I said before, of the design and the implementation of SLOs. Um, to do that, they surveyed teachers in 10 districts, uh, the six innovation districts and four additional districts so that we, they would go beyond the innovation consortium. They interviewed principals and um, evaluation specialists, superintendents, and union leaders in every one of those districts, as well as statewide officials from the Department of Education, myself, um, Larry Pirtle, president of the NEA, Frank Flynn, president of the RAFTHP. And so they gathered an enormous amount of data. In fact, um, people were quite surprised by the response to the surveys that were conducted. Usually when you do a survey, I think a lot of people know that you're pleased if you get about 30% of um, response rate, a 30% response rate. In some of our districts, it was a 90% response rate among all teachers and principals. And overall, it was a 70% response rate. And so we feel very confident that not only do we have the, right, have the right group conducting the analysis, we had great participation from leadership um, and on the ground, classroom teachers, principals, and so forth. What we found, quite frankly, affirmed what we'd been hearing. Um, that it's a great idea, and as one principal said, the problem is we need to focus on doing this right instead of just doing it. And so what we learned were things like um, issues with communication, that teachers and principals, this was rolled out right on top of the you know, first real full year of implementing the rest of the new evaluation system, and teachers and principals were confused, didn't have um, similar understandings about SLOs um, across the districts. Training was another issue. That again, while this sounds like it's something that's a part and parcel of what teachers and principals do all the time, the new system, um, the approval of the student learning objectives, the assessments that needed to be used to determine student progress, the way in which an evaluator or principal was told to um, determine whether or not the objectives had been met, that involved a lot of training. And there wasn't really enough training or deep enough training to ensure that if you and I were each going to review a student learning objective, that the teacher who submitted that student learning objective could feel confident that we would each see it the same way. And so the consistency was a problem. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, one is the weighting of the student learning objectives with the other components of teacher evaluation um, that appear to be out of sync and clearly at least um, felt that way on the part of teachers and principals. And the tie to certification or the high stakes nature of the utilization of student learning objectives, whether perceived or real, 
is an actual problem in terms of the field embracing this. Um, what the experts tell us is that we should spend time focusing on student learning objectives as an instructional tool something that we help teachers and principals get better at because it helps them with their instruction, because it helps them know more about students. But because of the current environment, they're struggling with that. How are you going to use this? Well, we've just gotten this report presented. I think you'll be um, showing that we've had a couple of forums where superintendents, union presidents, and then recently a group of about 150 educators learned about um, the report's recommendations. And the recommendations are very close to what I just told you in terms of the findings. And so we intend to use this report to continue our advocacy for getting student learning objectives right. We want to continue to ask for a separation of the use of student learning objective ratings from teacher effectiveness ratings until we're certain that the system is um, valid and reliable and can be used appropriately for those purposes. And last but not least, uh, we're going to honor our commitment to continue to provide the information and training that we think is necessary so that as we're doing this advocacy, um, we will be working in the districts on student learning objectives and helping our teachers see them first and foremost as an instructional tool, something that will benefit them in their practice, but most importantly, benefit students because we'll have better data on where they start the year, where they end the year, and the kinds of strategies that teachers need to employ to, to help them really achieve the goals that we set for them. Let me go back to something that we talked about a long time ago. Um, and I'll make this short and to the point. You just said something that you provided the support for teachers to get the kind of training that they require to be effective, particularly the people in your innovation districts where you have I3 coordinators that are going in supporting this initiative in each one. How much money has the Federation of Teachers, or not even how much money, what describe for me very quickly the kind of professional development that's been provided by the union to ensure that teachers are supported in this initiative? Well, over the last four years, uh, the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers has been able to secure grants from the American Federation of Teachers, from the United States Department of Education, and from the Gates Foundation to provide evaluator training. So interestingly, we've been spending a lot of time, effort, and funding to train principals and evaluators um, in the methodology of evaluation. Um, the Department of Education has actually provided the training for evaluators in student learning objectives. Uh, that's a Rhode Island Department of Education requirement, and it was not part of the design that we came up with for evaluation. However, we are finding that teachers and principals need more support in terms of effectively implementing student learning objectives. So we have recently committed and are working with our point people on evaluation and our other um, professional development experts um, through the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and the Innovation Consortium to um, better understand what supports teachers and principals need. And we've already begun providing um, some training modules for uh, informational and hopefully in the future over the course of this year for more uh, direct training purposes um, to help support the work that we know needs to happen in the districts. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming. I want to compliment you and the Federation of Teachers um, for your commitment to this model, for seeking out the funds to be able to support the model, and, and for the collaboration that you've done with the Department of Education, with superintendents, and with principals in the school to ensure that the model is effective for students and for teachers. I want to thank you for attending today. I want to thank you for viewing. We look forward to ongoing discussions around the uh, issue of teacher evaluation, student learning, learning outcomes, and a whole variety of things that are being looked at by the state and in cooperation with the Federation of Teachers and the NEA around this issue on teacher evaluation. Thank you for watching this evening, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask a couple questions to you as well. 
you don't need to use your red or green. I'd just like to ask you, how many of you think that our children, America's children, are so stupid and so lazy that they can't learn? How many of you think that? Nobody thinks that? Okay. How many of you believe that the majority of our teachers are so lazy or so incompetent that they can't teach? Nobody believes that. Then how do you account for the fact that more than two-thirds of our students can't score proficiently on these tests? They're deemed not to, be, not to have learned what they were supposed to learn. How, how do we account for that? Does it occur to anybody that maybe we should assume that if the kids are trying hard and the teachers are trying hard, and they're still not making any progress. I believe it was No Child Left Behind said by the year 2014, all of our children would be proficient in math and science. And we ratcheted up the tests, and we ratcheted up the pressure, we failed schools, we failed students, and we haven't made any progress. Two thirds of our students nationally and in Rhode Island still aren't scoring proficiently on these tests. So maybe there's something wrong with the system. I mean, has that ever occurred to anybody that maybe there's something wrong with the system? After all, standardized tests are all about accountability. High-stakes standardized tests are all about accountability. You hold the students accountable. If they don't pass the test, they don't graduate. They don't move on to the next grade. You hold the teachers accountable, and now we're going to have an evaluation system postponed for a year because the teachers raised hell. That's based on student test scores. So. How is it that these kids manage to get into high school without having learned what they need to learn, the basics? How is it that our teachers are being evaluated and found wanting in this? Is it because of the system? Are kids not learning what they should learn? Then who's accountable for that? Who's responsible for that? If it's not the kids and it's not the teachers, and I can't believe it's the parents, even though they're often blamed for all of this. I think it's the system. The politicians are the only ones who aren't held accountable for the condition of our schools. They just keep doubling down. It's going to be tougher. We're going to beat the donkey until it runs faster. We're going to demand more. Standardized tests are immoral and wrong. They don't really accomplish anything. They don't contribute to learning. Uh, the rationale for them is that they give us a snapshot of how well the system is doing. Well, I've been in this business now for 25 years, and I can tell you, a snapshot or no snapshot, we're not doing very well, and we haven't been doing very well, and there are all kinds of measures that tell us that besides standardized test scores. So what is the, what, I don't have, I can't understand a single reason why we would spend as much money as we do, as much effort as we do, and, and cause as much harm as we do with high-stakes standardized tests. If it's only to find out how the system is doing, then that's not a very good trade-off. Now, some people say it helps us find out where the kids are, are weak and improve our teaching and, and do, do a better job with the kids. But that's a lot of baloney, too, because by the time the test scores are in, that class is either graduated or move on to the next grade. I don't think anybody seriously takes these tests to down and says, oh, we've got to do a better job teaching that unit in civics or that unit in mathematics. You know, Einstein said, everybody has talent and ability. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll spend the rest of its life thinking it's stupid. There are a lot of fish in our system, not just autistic kids or special education kids, regular kids who just don't want to put up with the requirements of the school. It's a one-size-fits-all system. It's designed to prepare kids to go to college, whether they want to go to college or not. The rhetoric is we're preparing kids for college and work, but that's baloney too. We're not preparing kids for work, despite the fact these kids are going to spend a third of their, li <coughs> their lives in job. <coughs> they graduate from school, and then if they go to college, and half of them manage to get through, uh, they don't have any concept of what the culture of work is, what's expected of them. Uh, we don't prepare them for, for specific jobs. We don't prepare them for work. So I think that we should start a discussion with tests like NECAP by asking ourselves, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of doing all these tests? 
to find out if the kids are meeting the standards, the standards that are designed to reflect college admission standards. Every kid takes so many courses in math, so many courses in science, so many courses in foreign language, all of these things designed to get you into college. If you want to be a construction worker, or a carpenter, or a, you name it, even an accountant, uh, that's too bad. You're going to prepare to go to college. That's great for the 15 or 20 percent of the kids who are going to go on and get a degree and or a, a, an advanced degree or a professional degree, we're going to become nuclear physicists or rocket scientists. Uh, but what about all those other kids? They have to go through the same motions because we have adopted a philosophy in this country of college for all. And we're punishing our children by forcing them into college. 50% of them don't graduate after they enroll in college. The average debt they rack up is 25,000 bucks, some as high as $100,000. And most of them who go major in business because they don't know what else to major in, and they go because they've been told the only way they're gonna avoid unemployment or working at McDonald's is if they go to college. So I, I propose we start this discussion in this state and nationally for the first time by demanding to know why we are spending so much money and so much effort and doing so much harm with these high stakes tests. And as was pointed out a minute ago, they're not universally acclaimed. I read just before I came here uh, the memorial address published by the Educational Testing Service on whether test scores are a valid way to evaluate teachers. And this is the Educational Testing Service. And, and the conclusion was they may have some value, but only under very strict conditions and, and, un, and done unwisely, they can cause more harm than good. And I think you can say the same thing about tests. Even the inventors of NECAP said it should not be used as a high stakes test. And yet we do it. And who's held accountable? The students are held accountable, the teachers are held accountable, and the schools are kind of held accountable. But Commissioner Giss isn't held accountable, and Chairman Mancuso isn't held accountable, and all those politicians aren't held accountable. After the students badgered business and legislative leaders to take this test, and 60% of them failed, I had the pleasure of having breakfast with a couple of prominent legislative leaders a couple of mornings later. And I said, how'd you guys do on the test? Oh, God. They, I didn't do well at all. I didn't do well at all. And, and they admitted they had flunked the test. And I said, well, how do you account for that? And one of them said, hell, you know, that was 30 years ago. I've forgotten all that stuff. And I said, duh. If, you, if it wasn't important for you to remember, why was it important for you to study in the first place? We assume that if we cram kids' heads full of stuff, whether they ever use it, whether they need it or anything else, we've done our job. Will they apply it? Will they ever use it? Will it make them better people? Will they be more constructive citizens and workers? That's beside the point. As long as we get the scores and the grades to move them on. So if we're going to hold people accountable, let's hold people accountable who have responsibility for making the system work. The obligation of the public schools is to educate all kids, not just the middle class white people from the suburbs, uh, not just kids who are motivated and want to go to college, but all kids, even kids who don't want to go to college. It's our obligation to educate. And if we don't do it, starting with the first day of school and do it well for those first six years, we may as well forget it. To hold seniors accountable now in their senior year for things they have never been taught, I think is unconscionable.